This is the ninth video for the Ethics and Legal Considerations part of the Animal Chiropractic class. In this video and the next, I'm going to talk about malpractice claims. In this video, I'm going to provide you an overview of the elements for malpractice claims. And in the next video, we'll talk about the damages recoverable in veterinary malpractice claims. The first thing I want to talk about is the scope of malpractice risk. There's a very big difference between treating animals and treating humans. The risk of a malpractice claim is much greater when you're treating human patients than when you're working with animals. So the veterinarians are probably already aware of that. And for the chiropractors, that probably gives them some relief. Now, that's not a universal statement. There still are some animals or some clients who will file malpractice claims if you injure their animals. Uh, some of the trends that are apparent, uh, equine practice, working with large animals like horses and cows, has the greatest exposure for malpractice, particularly with horses, and particularly with horses of greater value. And the reason for that is because the amount of the claim is greater. In many of these cases, and for many of these species, the insurance companies will spend more in legal fees fighting these claims than the claims they will pay. Part of the reason for that is because the damages in many cases for most animals, especially small animals like dogs and cats, the damages are so very, very low. Another trend to pay attention to is an increase in the claims for human injuries. Of course, the humans get injured when the animal is not properly restrained or when the animal reacts in an unexpected way when a chiropractic adjustment is provided. So a traditional malpractice claim is a claim based on negligence. And I want to spend a minute talking about the differences between claims for breach of contract and claims for negligence. The reason I think this is important is if you make contracts carelessly, if you make promises carelessly, if you make warranties or guarantees carelessly, you make the job of the plaintiff's lawyer much easier when they file these lawsuits. Negligence claims are more difficult to prove and more expensive to prove than breach of contract claims. Negligence claims will almost always require an expert witness. Contract claims usually will not. So the essential elements of a negligence cause of action, the four elements are duty, breach of duty, proximate cause, and damages. The duty element is usually pretty easy to establish. Once the client has shown that there is a valid veterinary client-patient relationship, it means the doctor had a duty to act in a way that is not careless or negligent in providing that treatment. Breach of duty may be more difficult to establish, and it usually requires testimony from an expert witness. The expert witness will testify about what a reasonable, prudent veterinarian would do, what the standard of care is for the profession, and how the veterinarian breached that duty. Uh, proximate cause will also require testimony from an expert witness in most cases. So the breach of duty by the doctor must cause the damages, the injury to the animal. And the damages, again, don't always require the testimony of an expert witness. Now, the reason I'm talking so much about expert witnesses is because it makes these cases much more expensive to pursue. Expert witnesses, especially doctors who are experts, are not inexpensive. On the other hand, a contract case does not require, usually, an expert witness. The elements of a contract claim are first that a valid contract existed. In other words, the doctor made a promise. And that promise may be in writing, or that promise may have just been a verbal promise. Uh, don't hide behind an idea or a misconception that verbal promises are not enforceable. There are many, many court cases where oral contracts are enforced. 
contracts do not need to be in writing. They should be, and it's much easier to enforce them if they are, but it's not a requirement that they be in writing in most cases. So the first element is that a contract existed. The doctor made a promise. The second element is that the client did what they were supposed to do. They performed or tendered performance. In other words, they brought the animal to you. They made it possible for you to examine and treat the animal. And they paid for that service. Third element is that the doctor breached the contract. Now note the difference. In order to establish breach of duty in a negligence case, I have to show what a reasonable, prudent veterinarian or animal chiropractor would do. But in a breach of contract case, I merely need to show that a promise was made and that the promise was not fulfilled. And then lastly, the fourth element for a contract claim is that the client was damaged as a result of the breach. You don't see a lot of veterinary malpractice cases because hiring an expert witness is usually more expensive than the amount of damages you will recover unless you're talking about an animal that had a particularly high value like a racehorse. Because of that expense, you don't see those cases. But doctors who are careless in the way that they make contracts and promises may make it easier to get themselves sued for a breach of contract case. So be very careful about how you make promises or what promises you make to clients. So again, the first element of negligence claim is breach of duty. Generally, the duty is to act as a reasonable, prudent person. But if you're a professional, you have to act as a reasonable, prudent professional. Now, certainly a reasonable, prudent veterinarian is one standard. There may be an additional standard for a reasonable, prudent animal chiropractor or chiropractic veterinarian. And that may be a more difficult standard to meet. That duty occurs, or, or the doctor owes that duty, once they have created a doctor-patient-client relationship. Of course, that can created, be created by an express acceptance. The doctor says, welcome to my practice. You're now my client, and I'm happy to treat your animal. It may also be created by a veterinarian or somebody who works for the veterinarian exercising their independent professional judgment. It happens in phone calls. Somebody may call the doctor's office and receive information about the best plan of treatment for the animal or whether the animal even needs treatment. If that advice turns out to be wrong, that doctor may have created that doctor-patient-client relationship just through that phone call. It's okay to listen to clients when they make calls but be very careful about making judgment calls about what care they need or the diagnosis or the treatment that's appropriate. It's also important to be careful in social situations. I know that when I get introduced to somebody for the first time as a lawyer, I almost always get questions about traffic tickets and contracts and the states and everything else, every other legal problem that person has ever had. If I'm not careful about how I handle those questions, I may create an attorney-client relationship. Now, I expect the same thing happens to animal chiropractors and veterinarians. As soon as you're introduced as someone who works on animals, you will immediately attract questions about the other person's animals. If you're not careful about how you answer those questions, if you exercise your professional judgment in the way you answer those questions, you can create that doctor-patient-client relationship. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all those social media websites also create a circumstance. It seems like a very informal situation, just like a social situation or a telephone call, but as soon as you start providing information about the diagnosis on, of the animal or the treatment that might be best for the animal, you have created a doctor-patient-client relationship. And this last one is the one that's probably the most frightening to me, is, is the doctor's staff, the doctor's employees, the workers in the doctor's office. 
can create that doctor-patient-client relationship. If they're working in a doctor's office and they communicate to somebody, they answer the telephone, or they're communicating on social media as a representative of the doctor's office, they can also create that doctor-patient-client relationship. So imagine the situation where the doctor has never talked to the client, but now all of a sudden they have a relationship with that patient and that client because the doctor's employee has created that situation. So monitor how your staff communicates. Make sure they understand that they are not veterinarians and they should not be communicating information about diagnoses or treatments so that you don't have problems where they create doctor-patient-client relationships. So once the duty is established, and again, that's usually fairly straightforward and easy to establish, once the element of duty is established, the second element is to prove that the doctor breached the duty. Generally, that's going to require proof of the standard of care. What would an ordinary, prudent veterinarian do under those circumstances? What care would they provide? What diagnosis would they make? And as I mentioned before, this almost always requires an expert witness. Be aware that as uh, our knowledge grows, the standard of care may change. And if you hold yourself out as a specialist, you hold yourself out as an animal chiropractor or a veterinarian who provides animal chiropractic care, you may be held to a higher standard of care. Breach of duty may include things like a failure to diagnose, failure to examine the patient adequately, failure to perform appropriate diagnostic tests, or incompetence in performing the examination and the diagnostics may result in a, in a claim based on failure to diagnose. Now again, that's probably going to require proof from an expert witness. Another way that a veterinarian or someone working with animals may be negligent is failing to properly restrain the animal. Uh, for smaller animals, this usually is not an issue. But for larger animals like horses, it can become an issue. Um, be very careful about whether you allow the owner to restrain the animal. Sometimes the animal is not under the owner's control. You know, I've seen some owners and dogs interact. It's very clear that the dog respects the owner and will do what the owner asks them to do. I've also seen situations where it's very clear that the animal is going to tell the owner what's going to happen. And, and that's a very dangerous situation if you're going to provide some kind of treatment on the animal because the animal may react in an unpredictable manner. Uh, sometimes the clients are aware enough to ask for assistance to restrain the animal. Certainly if they ask for assistance, the veterinarian should provide that assistance. Certainly if it appears that the animal is not under the owner's control, the veterinarian should provide that assistance. Pay attention to owners who exhibit fear or not don't have much experience working with the animals or have inability or incompetence in restraining the animals and provide the restraint that's necessary to protect the veterinarian, the client, and the staff in the room. Sometimes the client is just flat too small to restrain a much larger animal. Uh, again, in those situations, work with the client, assist the client in restraining the animal. And sometimes the undertaking involves a procedure or a treatment that's likely to cause pain to the patient if it's going to cause pain or discomfort to the patient, you can expect the animal to react like an animal would react, and they tend to be defensive. So make sure they're properly restrained before you provide the treatment. The third element of a negligence claim is proximate cause. Now, proximate cause is a fancy legal term it basically means there needs to be a close enough causal relationship between the mistake or the breach of duty by the doctor and the damages that are caused by that uh, mistake. So there needs to be foreseeable that when that mistake is made, it's going to cause this type of damage. 
and there needs to be a direct causal relationship between the mistake or breach of duty and the damages that occur. Again, this element, just like the breach of duty, will usually require testimony from an expert witness. Uh, because of the expense of those expert witnesses, many veterinary malpractice claims never get filed because there's simply not enough money involved in it to make it worth the attorney's time to pursue that case. In the next video, we'll talk about the last element for negligence claims, and that's the damages and how the damages are valued.